so I'll talk today about the clinical validation of the uh, whole genome methylation profiling classifier for copy number for central nervous system tumors that we did at Northwestern. And we'll talk about that. So my name is Lucas. I'm assistant professor of pathology. I'm director of bioinformatics at Northwestern Medicine and Northwestern Memorial Hospital. Okay, so. Look at that. I don't think that works. Okay. There you go. Uh, disclosures, uh, the opinions expressed during this presentation and those of the speaker are mine, not Illumina's opinions. Illumina speak for my travel. This, okay. And to speak uh, here at the CGC and our meeting. Okay, uh, introduction. Uh, in 2021, uh, the guidelines for the WHO guidelines for CNS tumors, for the classification of CNS tumors, got updated to include a bunch of things like uh, cytogenetic, molecular genetics, epigenetic features, uh, together with morphology, so, to, so you can make a comprehensive classification of those samples. Um, for epigenetics, we started using DNA array methylation profiling, and there's many benefits associated with that. The first one is the classification of the tumors with challenging morphology. A lot of times, the pathologist will look at the slides, you can't tell what's happening, and with methylation array, we get a clear output of that, and we can identify many cases, we can tell exactly what that entity is. And the same with subtypes, with, uh, subtypes within a given family. For example, we have a bunch of glioblastomas. You can have like a small different entities that have different prognosis. And you can tell that very well using um, methylation array. So all this work started by the German group in 2018. They published uh, the first paper in Nature uh, with the DNA uh, methylation-based classification of syndrome tumors. This was 2018. They came up with another paper which was a practical implementation of the DNA methylation array. Uh, this laid the groundwork that, that for the work that I'm showing here today. They published a very nice data set, and they, that, what bring, so in, that happened in 2018, and now 2021, and it's already on the W22, 20, 21, the WHO got updated to include that because it has make a huge difference in the field of, uh, of uh, CNS tumors. Okay, so the FKZ has a classifier that's publicly available. You can go there, you can download it. You cannot download it, you can use the website. There's many problems with that for us in the United States. The first problem is that that's not a cap clear validated uh, website, it's research only. So clinical labs shouldn't be using that. I know that many people do, but you shouldn't be doing it. Uh, second, it's not HIPAA compliant, uh, because the laws are different there, that's in Germany. And second, uh, and the most important to me, is that's hosted by a third party. So that uh, you don't have control to a code updates. So if they update the classifier, if they release a new version, if they change a new version, they'll do it without warning to you. Uh, you that creates a lot of problems with validation. Sometimes you don't have problem validations. Then we, you will have problems with uh, the downtime that you have for clinical patients uh, waiting for a sample. And, and also data ownership and storage. You don't know what they're gonna do with that data. The data is in their server, it's gone. So I don't think that's good practice. Because of that, we decided to develop and validate uh, our own classifier at Northwestern Medicine. And we published that paper uh, in May this year that contains all uh, our experience and how we did it. So, okay, the sample workflow. The, uh, the name methylation array in the lab is quite simple. It's not that complicated. Uh, everybody has done an array, can probably do it. So you do in DNA extraction, then you do bisulfite conversion, you do beta array hybridization, you do, and then you read the microarray, uh, easy. And then you get the raw data. That's where things get a little bit more complicated that you need some expertise to actually make sense of that data. Once you get the raw data, you need to do normalization filtration of that data. You need to calculate the beta values, which I'll explain what it is in, in a moment. And then you need to have your classifier. You need to train your classifier, you need to put the data through with that. After you get your classifier, you need to normalize the scores using logistic regression. And then you get a calibrated score, which is a probability. Um, okay, so the raw methylation data, what, what does it look like? So you get an IDAT file, which is the image file. And there's two, two channels. There's a red and green channel, one for methylated, one for unmethylated. And to load that and work with that data is pretty easy. You can, there's many sort of R packages that has been 
validated and used in the field, like Minfi, Lima, Lumi, anyone that's a bioinformatician probably has came across those. And what those files contain is a matrix of raw signals, this is the intensity of uh, hybridization. So the first step that you do is normalize those arrays. So you need to normal, normalization of the array is different probes will behave differently uh, across the array. You need to make sure that they are, you compare apple, apples to apples, so those signals are normalized, as you do for any array. Uh, then you need to remove probes with uh, SNPs, uh, SNPs. You need to do that because the SNPs will interfere in your hybridization and how your probes behave. So if you have a SNP and your probe has that SNP, the fact that you have that SNP is gonna boost your signal and that's not what you wanna look. You wanna look at pure methylation signals. You wanna make sure that you're looking at the correct things. And we also remove X and Y chromosome probes for this application because we don't wanna classify it to be biased or do classifications based on imbalance of sex inside your cohort. You don't want that, so you wanna take them out. You wanna make sure that this is uh, taken, care of, taken into account. And from that, you generate a beta matrix. Okay, a beta matrix. Uh, it comes from, there's a beta value. Uh, what is a beta value? Beta value is called a beta value because it follows a beta distribution. But, and it's a simple value, it's a value between zero and one, and it's basically the ratio between methylated signal divided by the total signal. So basically for a given uh, probe, you're gonna get the max, the max value between the methylation signal and zero because if it's, you don't want a negative value there. And you're gonna divide by the sum of the methylation and the methylated signal and plus an offset of 100 that you do just because you want to make sure that you regularize the beta value so anything is very low. So that's what you get. So you get a, in the end, what you're gonna get is a matrix of samples and a beta value between, a value between zero and one for all the, uh, for everything that you have, for all the genes and probes that you have. Uh, it's important to know, so uh, uh, the good thing about the beta value that it's easy to interpret that value. So if it is a value of one, you're fully methylated, your probe is fully methylated. It's a value of zero, you have no methylated signal there. So, uh, and in between those values, so, okay. So the next thing that you need to do is that then, uh, that's where the things get interesting in the MyFormX perspective, is actually uh, doing a classifier training. You need to create a classifier, that's what we did. And so after you do array uh, pre-processing normalization, what you need to do is feature selection. And we go into feature selection a little bit more in detail. Then you do uh, classifier training. In that case, we use a random forest, uh, and you test that. And then you need to do recalibration of the scores that comes out of the random forest. Okay, um, training data. So what do we use for the training data is the data that came out of the paper uh, from 2018, and it comes with 2,801 CNS samples. That is the GO session number, if you're interested in that. It has 91 classes uh, among, uh, of copy of CNS tumors, uh, 91 classes. It's a very rich data set, very well curated, very high quality. That uh, came from that paper, and that paper is really good, and that's the, the biggest thing with that paper to me. You know, uh, the, such a nice data set. So after that, you need to do a feature selection. So we do any machine learning applications, we usually we do a feature selection. The idea of feature selection is to faster computation, so uh, that data is re very large, that array data. You, we're talking about uh, 800,000 probes that you have there, uh, you have, and you have 2,000 samples. So imagine the size of that data. It's very high dimensionality, and you need to make sure that you can do that in, uh, in your lifetime, right? So you need to do faster computation. And also you want to do noise reduction. Imagine that the great majority of those features, those probes in your genome, they will actually be non-informative. They will have, uh, uh, they'll be the same. They'll be constant across all samples. That's non-informative, you need to make sure that you can fish out that signal and actually get the, the probes that can help you classify a sample. So that's, all, that's what feature selection is doing. That's what you're trying to do. And the way we do feature selection, uh, we also use a random forest to do feature selection. Um, what you do is you get your data set, you random split your data set into, data, into a, uh, you, you split the cell randomly, like uh, as you do a cross validation, and then you reserve a, por a portion of your model to do training, a portion of your model to a portion of the data to do training, and a portion of your data to do testing. You train the, the random forest classifier, and from that you look at features that actually have an impact on your accuracy. 
features that, if, you, if I remove a feature from my random forest, and that decreases my accuracy, I know that feature is important for classification, so I keep it. We do that 100 times, you do that 100 times, and then you come at the end with a set of features that you, that you should use in a classification. That's, that's, that's how it works. So we do a random forest classifier. For those who do not, who do not know what a random forest classifier is, it's a supervised learning algorithm, uh, like many other algorithms. Supervised means that you need to give the labels to the algorithm. It's not gonna find the structure of the data to you. So you need to, to know what you're looking for. So basically I need to know that glioblastoma is a glioblastoma, the oligodendroma is a oligodendroma, and so on and so forth. Uh, Renault Forest is it's a very, uh, it can do classification and regression. In that case, we're doing classification. And what it is, for those who don't know what it is, it's, it's, it comes, it's related to what a decision tree is. Everybody knows what a decision tree is. Everybody has seen a clinical decision guideline tree basically saying if, it, if it variable A is, if the tumor is bigger than like, I don't know, one centimeter is, is grade three, so on and so forth. So it's, if you see that those trees, you know what a classification tree is. And that comes from that. The, the difference here that we're doing that at a much higher scale with, with a lot of data and you're doing 10,000 of trees. Um, so that's what it looks like. Um, okay, so basically after you had your probes identified and you know what they are, selection, what you need to do is to uh, train your random forest classifier. Uh, we get the, uh, in our case, we use the 10,000 most important features that we identify in the fish selection step. And then what you do, you're gonna fit 10,000 trees with those 10,000 features. Um, and you train them and you get a random forest uh, classifier. So the random forest for each tree will output a class. So basically you have 10,000, you're gonna have 10,000 values that come out of those trees, which will be a class, right? Uh, but the problem, and you could use that data to calculate a probability, but that probability is not equivalent among classes. So all you need to do is to normalize the probability that comes out of the random forests. And you wanna do that because when you're looking at the data and the clinicians making the interpretation of that data, he wants the probability to be to be associated with the probability of that sample belonging to that class. And that's what you're looking for. So that's why you need to normalize it. Uh, and the normalization is quite simple. Uh, all you do is a uh, logistic regression. Uh, and the logistic regression, the, in the independent variables are the scores that come out of the random forest. And the dependent variables are the classes. And you train that and that's it. Okay. So after you have the, the, you have the classifier, you have the logistic regression model, all you need to do is to validate your data set. That's, that's how you did. So um, the German group has a validation set also with uh, 1,100 samples that we used. And though that's, that data set is independent of the data set that I used for training the model. The different data sets, completely different, separate. The, 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 the training process never saw this data. And we compared the, the goal here was, uh, part of the goal was to compare the the performance of our classifier and the Northwestern classifier with the DFKZ, the German classifier, which is the standard classifier. Um, and for that, we used that data and also generated a bunch of in-house data. We did 53 tumors. We run both classifiers. And uh, the gold standard for that data is the integrated diagnosis that a pathologist, that a pathologist made. And they took in, into consideration the morphology, the HC, the NGS, microarray, and everything. Uh, Another, another thing that's useful that I'll show a picture later is the dimensionality reduction, uh, the Disney algorithm. So if everyone, everyone has seen a report or, have, uh, or familiar with, my, uh, with the name methylation on CNS tumors, they have seen uh, one of those plots. And that is just a way of reducing the dimensionality of the data so you can see that data in 2D in a plot. Uh, and I'll show what it looks like. It's very colorful, very beautiful. People like it a lot. Uh, okay, so results, this is when we validate the classifier. Uh, we show here the area under the curve for our classifier and the DFKZ classifier. As you can see, uh, they are very close. Uh, we have a 0 0.964 and they have a 0 0.966. Uh, on that graph, you see two lines. You see a black line and a dotted line. The black line is our, under our area under the curve for our algorithm. And the dotted line is the area under the curve for the the FKZ algorithm. So you see they overlap quite well. 
Um, we do one of the reasons why we do a, uh, AUC curve is actually to determine a cutoff point so you can guarantee specificity and sensitivity for your test at a given threshold. Uh, our best threshold here is 0 0.9 as we get the optimal sensitivity and specificity. Um, and our specificity, the sensitivity for DNM classifier as a uh, 0 0.9 is 88.6%. Specificity is 94%. And for DFKZ, it's actually kind of the opposite. It's sensitive is 94%, specificity is 85%. Uh, here is, we look at the scores, and we want to see if the distribution of scores between us and the FKZ classifier, it's quite similar. And uh, as you can see here, uh, this is a, a scatter plot uh, showing that data. Uh, the, the crosses, are actually the concordant data. So basically our scores and their scores are concordant and the nominal class is also concordant. If you look at the axis, uh, is scores are different and you have, we have some scores are different like uh, our classifier gave a higher score than their, their classifier did. But for all those cases, the nominal class is the same. So actually what we, the value that we predict, the class that we're predicting is actually the same class. And I have a couple, uh, couple samples that are actually discordant. The, the score is different, the classification is different. So we did an in-house of uh, uh, validation and we used a 0 0.9 as our cutoff. And out of that, we got 70% correct. And the FKZ got 77% correct. One thing to notice here that the FKZ, a lot of samples uh, have a different denominator here, like uh, it's 49 on 53. Those samples failed when you put from the website. Give me an error, I don't know why. So that's illustrating a problem that you can have. You can send some data, the, the data might not return an error, might not return the data that you want to, and you don't want a clinical patient, uh, a patient waiting. Uh, if we ignore the cutoff, we see that uh, our classification score, it's 9.5% uh, correct, and the FKZ is 92% correct. So. What is saying that nominally, or like the class that come out of the classifier, saying this is a glioma, this is a glioblastoma, this is a oligodroma, it's 90% of the time correct. Sometimes it doesn't reach the 0.9 cutoff, and then we consider there are no match, but we still have useful data there. If we're close to 0.9, like a 0 0.8, 0 0.7, usually you can somewhat trust that classification value with, uh, given the other data that you have, the NGS data, you can make that interpretation. Uh, this is looking at the correlation between our scores and the scores generated by the, the FKZ, and it's 92%, so the scores are pretty much concordant. We also look at uh, interfering substances, uh, things that could make uh, influence, actually, the performance of the classifier. Um, we don't see a, a very strong correlation with blood, necrosis, or tumor cellularity, but what I have to say is that tumor cellularity does impact uh, in our experience, does impact uh, the, the amount of matches or matches that you have. You don't want uh, samples with a tumor purity that's too low, like below 40%. Usually you see a decline on the, the magnitude of those scores. Uh, this is a typical case. This is uh, to say uh, how our reports look like. Uh, so for this case, you have, uh, you have ATRX, you have IDH1 mutation, TV3, CDK1 and 2 loss. When you put for the classifier, that's what you get, IDH glioma, astrocytoma, it matches the astrocytoma profile. And, uh, and uh, what we, how we report these things is everything that has a score above 0.9, we consider a match. For a subclass, for example, like this, in this case, IDH glioma is a superclass. Astrocytoma is the subclass of IDH glioma. Uh, as long as it has 0.5, 50% uh, the score is bigger than 0.5, we consider that a match for the subclass. Uh, this is what the uh, Disney plot looks like. You see that plot on the yellow, the yellow cluster is the oligodendroma cluster, like astrocytoma clusters, and you see that the sample uh, is right there, like uh, in the middle of the cluster, showing that, that that's. So we use that in, in relate, we use that in conjunction with the random forest results to make interpretation. You can't use a Disney plot for, um, for classification only because if I have a lung cancer and I run it and I put this plot, it will land somewhere. It might land in the wrong place. It might not be a tumor, it might be a lung tumor. And you might say, oh, lung tumor is a glioma. It's not, it's a lung tumor. 
So you can you have to use this in conjunction with the Reno Forest classifier and that, that the results. Uh, we also get copy number plots. Uh, in that case, uh, we don't usually rely too much on those copy number plots because we have some problems. If you look at those, you see that the CDKN2A is not deleted on this plot, and that sample has a CDKN AB deletion um, that was caught by, uh, that was uh, detected by MGS. Uh, we work on that to make it better, but it's a well-behaved sample. Uh, usually, large deletions, 1P19Q, you 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 would see them; they, they will be pretty clear. Uh, so uh, discussion. Uh, so it's a. Uh, the public available data sets are invaluable. Like we couldn't curate that many samples by ourselves. The 3,000 samples, that's, uh, uh, that's pretty nice. The groundwork by the FKC was essential to a classifier. We just follow what they're doing to some extent. We just make some modifications, but the uh, framework's the same. Uh, we see a little bit lower accuracy of our, um, of our in-house samples. And the, we think the reason for that is that they're old FFP, FFP blocks. Uh, there might be lower quality samples for the samples that didn't get classified. Uh, this is very rapid and it's very cost effective. Uh, we usually have a turnaround time less than seven days for these tests. And having higher tumor celerity does improve classification success. So if you have higher purity samples, you're going to get better results. Uh, conclusions. Uh, we did a successful validation uh, of whole genome methylation profile uh, here at Northwestern Medicine. We have our own classifier. We offer that routinely right now. Uh, the classifier lives in a control environment. It's uh, in a CapClear certified lab. We have control of updates, control of the code, everything. And uh, we hope that in the future, more people will be running this and we will be able to get a most, most institutional data uh, repository to make these classifiers better, to identify um, entities, red tumors that we don't know, that we haven't seen. Uh, and I think they will be, they'll be I think this would be re really nice to do. Acknowledgements, I want to thank Illumina for the opportunity. I want to thank everybody in NOFS and uh, medicine uh, at the Diagnostic Molecular Biology Lab where I work on, and everybody that contributed to, to this work. If you have any questions, I'm happy to ask them. Thank you. So thank you, Lucas. Yeah. We've got plenty of time for questions. So I invite anyone who has questions to, to come up. I'm actually going to go check the computer over there to see if there's any online ones. Yeah. Um, thank you for that presentation. It was very useful. So on a practical point of view, what was your decision in the clinical laboratory to spend the time to validate this? And now that you have it clinically validated, is it, do you run one per week? Do you batch them? Do you feel that you have enough within your institution to support this on a routine, yeah. you know, considering tech time yeah. and all the time you spent on validating yeah. it? So we went live on November 29th last year. We have been running about 24 samples a week on that. So we have a, a large data set right now. Uh, the reason why, because people were not, so we wanted to have the expertise to do those things, and we wanted to also to expand to different cancer types, which we're doing right now. Uh, the physicians really wanted uh, the, the methylation array experience, like neuro neuropathology really wants that, because it makes a huge difference on diagnosis right now. There are a lot of difficult cases that we can make a diagnosis that we couldn't do before. That's based the rationale of why we did it. Uh, we didn't want to rely on uh, the, the FKZ public available classifier because we're not confident that they'll be there forever. We didn't know it was be robust. We don't know the uptime on that. Those are the reasons. So the around time is, yeah, so we, we, do, we have a tech basically that's doing that every week. We have someone that's, result, and we're doing three chips every week. It hasn't been much of a problem. It has been going pretty smoothly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Lucas, for this really great presentation. And thank you for Illumina for uh, sponsoring this talk. Um, so I have a little bit of a politically maybe incorrect sure. question. But, yeah. uh, but the whole idea is to validate it in a CAP-CLIA yep. um, environment. What is your, um, 
kind of um, thoughts about sharing this classifier with other laboratories yes. in the U.S. that would worry about the, the CLIA CAP um, certification? And yeah. how would you go about, you know, proving really that this is better because it's under this kind of regulatory, it's better than the, than the German database? Well, I mean, I think everybody's afraid of lawyers. I don't have a lawyer <laughs> knocking on my door and saying, you know, you, you cannot be doing this. So we don't want that, right? So that, that, that's one of the things. Um, sharing the classifier, yeah, I think the classifier can, uh, we're not sharing the classifier right now because of liability, it has to have a contract with MM, it has to be all these hoops. That, but what I have to say is, if to me, it's like any other test that you do. And so if you do an NGS test, if you buy an NGS test from a company, you need to do a calculated validation, right, on your own. And that would be the same thing. So if I give you the classifier, you would just do a small validation on your own lab, make sure it performs fine, and go a merry way and, and start doing that clinically. Um, yeah, I think that's, I don't think it's that challenging. It's a, I think it's more like a bureaucratic process that we need to go over, you know. That's what I think of CAPCLI and all, everything else, you know. Yeah, thanks a lot yeah. uh, for that talk, and sorry, I could be lack of sleep here, because I think I, uh, I understand the classification, but what's the clinical application? So you have a sample that comes in, yeah. it's marked as GBM, yeah. and it lands in oligodendroglioma. Yeah. Is that basically the idea here? Yeah, it is. So uh, it depends. Sometimes the pathologist cannot tell what the sample is. They just don't know, so it's brain. That's what they tell, they tell you. There's the, a lot of entities have overlapping features, which they cannot tell, and they're very difficult cases. The classifier tells you what they are uh, specifically, so that's very helpful on that. And it's also helpful to distinguish subclasses, which you cannot see in a microscope. You, you just don't know what they are. Like, uh, uh, there's many subclasses of glioblastoma, of gliomas that you can't tell. Uh, ependymomas, they have uh, several classes of them, and the, the clinician will tell you that it is ependymoma. There's not ependymoma A or B or something. Yeah. Right, that was, uh, second part was exactly yeah. that question. So does it create subclasses that are not known histologically? Yes, we, we have even more classes than a pathologist would be able to distinguish. Yes, there are okay. more. Last final question. So yeah. have you looked at integrating CNV with the methylation to improve the performance of the yes. classifier? Yes, uh, we, we're working on that. We have some data. So we do, the way they do diagnosis is we look at CNV through OncoScan, or look at CNV from uh, NGS. We also do, most of the cases we do NGS. So they do have NGS uh, copy number data and array data. So the interpretation that happens on the methylation array results is a, integra is a, it's, it's a, it's a multi-factor, right? The, the pathologist will look at how it looks in the microscope, what the molecular data looks like, and what the methylation array looks like to make a decision on that. So yeah. Thank you. This was a great talk. Um, the question that I have is that there's a lot of work that goes into dealing with cancer samples, yeah. but also with the expertise that you've just shown, could you apply this to some constitutional disorders? And has anybody yeah. asked you about that? Uh, I, we haven't done constitutional disorders, but if they're different, so what happens with methylation? Methylation, why it works really well to me in methylation is because the epigenomics will have a component of it, which is germline, that comes from the cell that derived that cancer, and the same way, and plus somatic uh, mutations, that, that epigenomic somatic mutations. So it's a combination of both. As long as, uh, if you look at constitutional things, as long as those cells are different, they have different profiles, yes, you could apply and distinguish them. I guess it's the case by case investigation, it depends if that's true or not for the given disease, yeah. Any additional questions? Yep, I see one. We've got plenty of time. No, we really do. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, great talk, and thanks again. Um, so we validated a couple of years ago in Oregon, and at the time, uh, DKFC was, I, I'm not sure if it was special, uh, a special case for us, but they allowed us to bring the R script in-house. So we're running the R script locally, yeah. so we're not having the same uh, cap right. issues there. Yeah. And they, I, maybe they're not doing that now, is that the case? I don't know, I, I know that we had conversations in Northwestern and there was many legal hoops that we had to go through it, and people were not willing to do that. So there was like a lot of bureaucracy that we had to deal with. 
and then we decide to do our own. Yeah, it was probably six or eight months of negotiation on our yeah, end as well. Exactly. And then, um, to to Sohil's question, um, yeah. when we validated, we also validated against microarrays that had been run on gliomas as well, and so we were yeah. validating copy number at the same time. Right. Um, and, and and as you know, for this, there's no there's no code, so we're right. having to actually uh, charge these out as as copy number um, uh, validation or co copy number evaluation. Yeah, uh, yeah, we ha we have been doing that. We're not doing like a, we report copy numbers, but we're not relying too much on them right now. We are working on that. We writing code to do that mm -hmm. and make it better. So has been active development on our lab to make sure. Like, so we have been looking at a lot of stuff, how to make the algorithm better, like uh, normal pool issues, you know, like uh, samples that you need to normalize and things like that. Uh, and yeah, we're doing that on our own. So we have all the code. I mean, I wrote all the code basically. So I have all that code, so I can change that. That's one benefit of having that in-house, so, yeah. And then we're also getting the MGMT promoter methodology We're doing status. that, too. Yeah, we, get, we do MGMT promoter, and that works really well. And that, but that's easy. That's really easy. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, just look at the probes. Uh, there are a couple probes in the methylation. On the, there are a couple probes that behave well with MGMT promoter. We just look at them, and we have a linear model for that there. And it, it works pretty well. Yeah, so we do that. We, do, we report copy number, the classifier, and the MGMT. Yeah, we do, we do all of those things. Those things. Thanks. Yeah. We have two online questions, so while we, um, in the meantime, there is a question. Do you have experience with the methylation analysis in liquid biopsies? Uh, we haven't done that. We have done some experimental. We, we're still thinking about that, but not for arrays, sequencing. Yeah. I don't know if that will work in array. Maybe. I, just don't, I, I haven't tried that yet. Okay. Yeah. Great talk. Uh, about the MGMT, yep. clinicians are normally used to either methylated yep. or unmethylated. Right. How do you deal with the... We, we have a cutoff. We have a model. We have a linear model that actually has a cutoff. So I know, based on the data correlation to pyrosequencing or, or any other standard method, what, like, uh, how a unmethylated and methylated probes behave. So I know that ratio pretty well. So I, I can tell, I can tell, we can tell. And the correlation is like 100%, like uh, uh, we never had a problem with that. The validation is actually one of the best validations that I have seen, MGMT validation. It's, it's pretty cut and dry, yeah. So, so there is actually a question uh, coming online um, saying that the CNV plot based on the methylation array seemed to have an MGMT deletion. So was that an actual deletion or an artifact of the methylation? I, for that sample, I don't know because we haven't validated that. I have to look at the NGS sample. Uh, it's not on NGS, so it could be real. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, great presentation. Uh, I have a question about the probability score recalibration. Yeah. Um, you said you fit the uh, scores into a logic regression yep. with re uh, regularized, so yep. uh, reduce the collinear features. Yep. Uh, have you ever tried to use this same approach before fitting the, the data into the model? I know there's also um, approaches like fit the uh, similar approach to reduce the collinearity be before fitting into the model so that the model could be more interpretable. Uh, I haven't tried that because rigid regression seems to work pretty well. I mean, you could try lasso or anything else, or you could try doing high, uh, taking collinearity before. We haven't tried that. Uh, there was no need to do that. I mean, the scores behave pretty well. Uh, I haven't tried that. But that's, that's a good approach. I mean, it could work. Okay. I would say that would be a problem, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, there is one final question online from Justin, who asks, how frequently do pathologists find that they cannot determine the classification of a sample? Uh, I don't know the exact percentage, but it's significant, because they were really excited when they got live with this. Uh, they, were, they were really happy about it. They're like, over, over the moon, you know. <laughs> so I think it helped a lot. So, but I don't know the exact proportion, but I, we have seen key, challenge cases. I have seen uh, at least a handful of them. I have seen a lot of handful cases that we couldn't see, uh, especially with like uh, tumors there, they don't know, or a patient has a primary metastasis, has a metastasis from like uh, any other source, they are not sure of tumor unknown origin. They want to rule out that's brain or not brain. So we get usually no matches for those. So that, that kind of helps uh, the evidence. The no matches can be very helpful as well and helps too, so, and the match too, so it's a mixed thing, yeah. Well, I don't see any additional questions. Lucas, thanks thank for you. a great talk. Uh, I'd like to thank Lucas as well as Illumina uh, very much. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much.